Hello and welcome to this episode of This Is Your Life. My name is Michael Hyatt and this is the podcast dedicated to intentional leadership. My goal is to help you live with more passion, work with greater focus, and lead with extraordinary influence. In this episode, I'll be talking about five strategies for building new habits. Who doesn't want new habits? I'm going to talk about that in this episode and more. But first, this podcast is brought to you by Platform University, an online membership site for helping you launch your personal platform or take it to the next level. And you can find out more at platformuniversity.com. If you're already a member, by the way, be sure and check out the new masterclass with Robert D. Smith, one of my best friends. We discussed generosity and the secret ingredient for platform building success. And Robert is the best example I know of, of someone who's generous and uh, it comes out of a place of abundance thinking. And he's really used this as a life and business strategy. And I think it's a very energetic, fun, helpful episode. So check us out at platformuniversity.com. A couple of things before we dive into the topic for this week. First of all, the series that Gail and I did over the last three weeks, Help, I'm Married to an Entrepreneur, uh, did exceedingly well. We had a great time with that. We were a little self-conscious about it, just kind of talking about our marriage and what worked for us and all the rest. But we felt so compelled to talk about this because we know so many entrepreneurs who have blown up their marriage because of their driven nature. Uh, Also, by the way, happens to leaders and other high achievers, not just entrepreneurs, But we also wanted to offer some help, not only to the entrepreneurs, but to the people who are married to them. So I hope you'll find that series helpful. Gail and I are actually thinking about turning that into a product. I don't know if we'll just take the podcast and package those up or if we'll go back into the studio and actually re-record them, taking some of the input we we have. I know some, uh, as we were listening to it, we thought, oh, we we wished we'd elaborated on that or added that particular subject that we forgot about. But at any rate, we're thinking about that. And if you think that's a good idea... I'd love to hear from you. You can just send us an email or record a voicemail message at michaelhyatt.com podcast question. Love to hear from you. We just got back from the platform conference in Dallas, Texas. We had an unbelievable time. It was three days of networking, of learning, of connecting with the larger community. We had a tremendous roster of speakers. And I just want to publicly thank Ken Davis, Michelle Cachat, Stu McLaren, Jeff Goins, Amy Porterfield, Cliff Ravenscraft, Derek Halpern, Ray Edwards, and Lisa Turkhurst. It was obvious that those guys not only gave us great content, but they really gave us their heart. These guys are first and foremost learners and secondarily experts and teachers. And that was evidenced by the fact that all of them stayed for the entire conference. They were in the room taking notes on every other speaker And I think really modeling what expertise is all about. And that is, if you're going to be an expert, you've got to be an expert learner first and foremost. The networking was outstanding at the conference. That's always one of my favorite things of any conference. And just the caliber of the attendees, and several of them remarked to me over the course of the few days that they just love the opportunity to meet people who are trying to do what they're doing. And I I think for the highlight for me, I mean, I loved learning from every single person there. I learned a ton of stuff, came back with a huge action list that I've got to put into practice now. But I think the highlight for me was on the last morning, Tuesday morning, we uh, had Stu McLaren share with the group about a charity that he has in Canada, he and his wife Amy have, called World Teacher Aid. And basically, they build schools in Kenya. And it was incredibly moving. And we decided to give the attendees an opportunity to contribute to the cause. And this was awesome. I mean, honestly, it brought me to tears. It brought Stu to tears. It moved us deeply. But we raised over $82,000 in about 20 minutes. And, you know, we didn't, um, you know, beat people up. I don't think we tried to make them feel guilty. We just laid the opportunity out there. And all of us connected to it emotionally. And that wasn't, by the way, one big gift from one rich donor But uh, we did have a number of $5,000 gifts and one gift of $12,500, but it was everybody pulling together. And it just demonstrated to me, once again, just the power of community and the power of connecting together on something that's bigger uh, than ourselves. And so anyway, that that to me, all by itself, made it worth it. We don't have the next conference nailed down. I'd give you the dates and send you to the website, but we don't have that nailed down yet. I can promise you this, though, the next platform conference 
will be tremendous. We will take it to the next level. It'll be even better than this year's. And it will probably be late fall of 2014, probably about November. We're working on that now. One other thing to mention is that my ebook, The Virtual Assistant Solution, came out. It's on Amazon and it's on Nook and all the other major ebook platforms. It's a small book, less than 50 pages. It's only $2.99. But if you've thought about employing a virtual assistant and maybe you feel overwhelmed, you feel like you're underwater, you love to offload the things that you hate, you love to focus on what you really love, you really need to consider a virtual assistant. And this book really talks about it, and it's quick read. You can read it probably in an hour, hour and a half. Again, it's only $2.99. It's got a 4.4 rating on Amazon. Uh, It's number one right now on management and leadership slash teams on Amazon. It's number six in small business and entrepreneurship. You can find out more on the Amazon site. Let me just give you a quick link. It's michaelhyatt.com slash VA, as in virtual assistant. Just easy way, quick way to remember it. But... Let's dive into the content, five strategies for building new habits. Now, I want to start with a confession. This is hard to say. It's a little bit embarrassing. But until 12 years ago, I didn't floss. That's right. (laughs) You heard me correctly. I didn't floss. My previous experience with the dentist had been so negative. Um, I've got kind of sensitive teeth, sensitive gums, and I'd had such a negative experience that I just found it easy to procrastinate. You know, I mean, I brushed my teeth twice a day, used mouthwash at night. So it wasn't like I was, you know, totally neglecting dental hygiene, but I wasn't flossing. And as any dental hygienist will tell you, there's a world of difference between those two things. So I just kept procrastinating. But Gail, as fate would have it, is a flosser. And I'm married to her and she kept bugging me periodically. She'd mention it to me and You know, I would tell her to get off my back and uh, she would stay at it. She finally, though, talked me into going to the dentist and she just basically said, look, you don't don't have to floss unless uh, you don't want to keep your teeth. And I thought, okay, maybe this is time uh, to do it. So again, about 12 years ago, I went to the dentist. My worst fears were confirmed when I found out that I had gum disease. But the good news is with a little education and some work, and I did have to do some remedial cleaning, but... Um, in about five minutes a day, over the course of a year, I got my gums and my teeth in excellent shape. And I stuck with that ever since. I promise you, I don't care how late it is at night. I don't care how tired I am. There may be some things that I blow off, but I always, always, always floss. But the reality is, is that change for any of us, I mean, it'd be maybe a little thing like that, that by the way, could have a big consequence. I don't want to lose all my teeth, but change is not easy. And Tony Schwartz, one of my favorite authors, wrote about this in a book called Be Excellent at Anything. And that was formerly called The Way We're Working Isn't Working. But here's just a couple of things that he noted in the book. 95% of those who lose weight on a diet regain it, and a significant percentage gain back more than they originally lost. It's not really that surprising, is it? You know, we've had that happen to ourselves. We know people that that's happened for. Here's another fact. Even after a heart attack, can't believe this one. Even after a heart attack, one of every seven patients makes any enduring changes around eating or exercising. Get that? One out of every seven makes an enduring change around eating or exercise. 25% of people abandon their New Year's resolutions after one week. 60% do so within six months. The average person makes the same New Year's resolution 10 separate times without success. Habits are hard to change. Another one, 70% of organizational change initiatives ultimately fail. And I've certainly been party to many of those in organizations. Well, the secret to change is acquiring new habits. You know, maybe it's uh, daily exercise in order to change from being unhealthy to being healthy or making more healthy eating choices. I introduced a new habit a little over a year ago. I've talked to it about it on this podcast, journaling. That's had a tremendous impact on me spiritually and emotionally, but it's a little daily habit. It takes 15 minutes a day, but it's had a big result, a big consequence in my life. Or reading. You know, I know people who have completely changed their intellectual life, their sense of contribution, their expertise, the trajectory of their career just by reading on a regular basis. And it's not like you've got to you know, walk in with a stack of books, roll up your sleeves and tackle them. 
But just reading a little bit every day. Like I always read when I go out and run. I do it through audible.com, audiobooks. But again, it's a little habit with a big result. Or meditation or prayer or just talking to your spouse. I remember when I had my mentoring group, one of the things, one of the exercises that we did at the suggestion of my friend Reggie Campbell was to practice what he calls five for five. And the idea was that you would walk into the house at the end of the day and walk within five feet of your spouse and spend five minutes listening to how their day went. And there were several of the guys in my mentoring group that reported back that when they did that with their wives, I had all men in my group, but when they did that with their wives, it really started having a noticeable impact on their marriages. Again, small habit, big impact, and that's the secret to change is managing those habits. And so I want to share with you in this episode five strategies for building new habits. These are five strategies that I found personally helpful as I've tried to acquire new habits, as I've tried to get rid of old habits, but as I've tried to acquire new habits. And by the way, I think that's the best way to get rid of an old habit is to supplant it or basically replace it with a positive habit. So I don't really try to focus on what I'm trying to quit as much as I am uh, what I want to acquire, the positive side of that. So again, five strategies. Strategy number one, envision the future. You know, it really helps me to fast forward to a destination. Um, If I don't change, where am I going to be in five years? If I do change conversely, where will I be? But my dentist literally used pictures to demonstrate for me two alternative futures. And that really did the trick because like, here's your mouth without flossing and where you're going to end up without any teeth or with uh, serious gum disease and what that looks like. Ugh. And on the other hand, here's what a healthy mouth looks like. And here's where you can be just by investing five minutes a day. And by the way, it doesn't even take five minutes to floss your teeth. But being able to kind of fast forward and seeing where this was all going had a huge impact on me. And I would say that's where you need to start. Like if you're trying to get in shape, for example, visualize what it's going to look like when you have a body that's strong and healthy. Or if you think about your marriage, you'd like to have a better marriage, visualize what that would be like if you really had a marriage where you loved your spouse and you had a great relationship and it was healthy and flourishing. Or think about your career. You know, you really want to tra- uh, change the trajectory of your career. You want to get a promotion. You want to start a business. Whatever that is, start by envisioning the future. I think we have to get clear on the vision first. Number two, second strategy, track your progress. I got to say, I'm one of those people that love to see progress. I live to check things off my to-do list. That's just how I'm wired. Very achievement-oriented. But I also like to see numeric improvement. Um, it's true with my dentist who measures the space between my teeth and my gums and gives me an overall score. I love that to see if I've improved since the last time I was there. I also do it even in little things like tracking my daily Bible reading. But if you can track your progress, even to check it off, like when I exercise, for example, I make a notation on my calendar, on my Google calendar. I just say exercise and then I, in the note, I put what the distance was or what my time was in order to just track my progress and see if I'm making movement toward my goal or towards the change that I want to see. Strategy number three, develop a ritual. You know, I know we often think of rituals as something negative, but they don't have to be. They can also be positive. But here's here's the deal. A ritual is anything you do regularly that you invest with meaning. Now think of that in a religious context. And, And again, it doesn't have to be negative. It can be positive. But it's anything you do regularly that you invest with meaning. So I have a morning ritual that I go through, and I'm very committed to that morning ritual because that sets me up for the most productive day. I have an evening ritual, which I've never even talked about on the podcast, but I will do that at some time. Several of you have asked about that. But you've got to commit to the behavior you want to start and then relate it to your ultimate goal, and that's the value of a ritual. But kind of construct a ritual for yourself. What would that look like? Uh, Just to go back to flossing, because that's a simple example. But I do that every night, a night, last thing before I go to bed. You know, I go through the whole dental hygiene thing, but I've ritualized it, systematized it, if you will, so that I don't miss it and so that I'm always faithful. And there's just like, like I feel almost guilty I, if I try to go to bed without flossing. I mean, honestly, I never do it. There are other habits that I, you know, I may miss from time to time, but not flossing. That's become so much a part of who I am 
because I've turned it into a ritual. It's just a behavior. Strategy number four, establish accountability. You know, I've done that with by hiring a, a trainer when I'm working out or trying to get into shape. Gail was my accountability partner with flossing. That doesn't always work with a spouse, by the way. But I've had other accountability partners for other habits I'm trying to build. They might be a friend. They might be somebody in my family. They may be somebody that I hire, but somebody that's going to hold me accountable. The key I've found, though, and the best way to do it is to find someone who's willing to do it with you. I remember when I was trying to get in shape in college, and a friend of mine would meet out on the curb every morning. We lived close to one another. We'd meet out on the curb every morning at 5 a.m., and we'd run. And just the fact that I knew that David was out on the street waiting for me would sometimes get me out the door when nothing else would. It was just that sense of accountability, that sense of uh, social responsibility. Also, when I was in college, I remember Mark DeVries and I used to study Greek together, and neither one of us were motivated on our own, but we created this accountability system where we would call each other first thing in the morning and say, hey, just want to make sure, are you on your Greek lesson for today? And you know, I'd call him, he'd call me, but we made sure that we connected first thing in the morning and we were on that. Now, here's what I don't want in accountability. And I don't know about you, but I don't want somebody who's going to act as a surrogate parent, you know, somebody that just nags me incessantly and drives me crazy. That, that kind of accountability makes me want to rebel and it probably does for you too. So make sure that you choose your accountability partners well, but use this as leverage to get you moving in the direction you want to move anyway. Fifth and final strategy is schedule checkups. I have my assistant, for example, schedule regular dental appointments. Left to my own devices, I would never get to it. I would procrastinate. But the fact that it continues to appear on my calendar at regular intervals means that I check up and I keep moving in the direction that I want to move. And it um, also provides another layer of accountability. You know, knowing that I'm going in for a checkup really keeps the temptation to slack off at bay. And in the same way, my annual physical keeps me motivated to eat well, to exercise, to get plenty of rest. And I do that also faithfully every single year as I have an annual physical. And so that's just another way to schedule a checkup and build the accountability into the system. So you really can defeat bad habits. You can also build new ones. And that's where I would focus my energy if you're trying to create change in your life is turn it into a habit and start moving in the direction of the change you want to achieve. And in order to overcome the odds and be successful, you've got to be deliberate, you've got to be persistent, but it really is possible. And I think if you just follow these five strategies, you'll be well on your way. Now, here's a question for you. What is one new habit that you'd like to build into your life? One new habit that you'd like to build into your life, something that you know, if you could do it consistently, it would have a big impact. Well, you can leave your comment on the show notes at michaelhyatt.com slash 72 as in episode 72. I'd love to hear from you. I'd love to see what you're working on. I know it will inspire all of us. Well, I hope this has been helpful and I'll be back in a minute with our listener Q&A segment. Welcome back. Tons of questions this week. Again, a few weeks ago, this is a little bit of an exception the last few weeks because we were doing the series on entrepreneurship and marriage. So we were taking only questions pertaining to that topic. But a few weeks prior to that, I kind of opened the floodgates and said I would not be doing questions that were specific to the topic I was covering, but I would take questions on anything related to my area of expertise, which is really leadership, platform building, productivity, publishing, that type of thing. So if you've got a question on that, I would love to hear from you. Again, at michaelhyatt.com slash podcast question, you can leave a voicemail message for me. But the first question for this week comes from Brian. Hi, Michael. My name is Brian Graves, and I'm calling from St. Louis, Missouri. My website and blog is located at partyprostogo.com. I was hoping you could dedicate a show to search engine optimization. I was just curious what you do to drive traffic to your site. Thank you very much for what you do. Just wanted to also let you know that I'm most certain that you and your team have touched so many lives with what you do. Thank you for sharing your expertise and experience. You are helping all of us in so many ways. Brian, first, thank you for your kind words. I really appreciate that. I'm glad to know that it's having an impact, um, what I'm doing and what my team is doing, especially. 
But in terms of dedicating an entire show to search and optimization, that's probably not going to happen. But let me just give you a few thoughts on it right now, because I know a lot of you are, who are listening to this podcast are bloggers who are platform builders, and, and you hear a lot from people, mostly people that are trying to sell services around this, that you need to use search engine optimization to get noticed. Now, I don't necessarily disagree with that. I just honestly haven't spent much time on it. Um, I really believe, and I think it's true in the new algorithms that uh, Google is using to establish website ranking, that it really has to do with your content. If you create good content, Google will reward you. That's the best search engine optimization I know of is create highly relevant content that people want to read, they want to share, and that other websites want to link to. Like that's job number one. And I say this when I talk about platform, when I speak on this topic, start with wow. And it's true when it comes to search engine optimization. Now, there are a few things that I do. Uh, one of the things is that when I'm creating a new blog post, I do run it through a WordPress plugin and it's not cheap, but it's been very helpful to me. It's called Scribe SEO, as in search engine optimization. It's a product that basically evaluates your blog post, runs it through some filters and through some algorithms, identifies your keywords, and then it gives it a score. And I already said earlier that I love anything that gives me a numeric rating and Scribe SEO does that on your blog post. More importantly, it points out where you can fix it, where you can uh, make it better. So again, I you know there's probably a lot that could be said. I probably don't know that much about it, but it's worked pretty well for me just to focus on creating great content. And I would encourage you, rather than uh, focusing much energy on SEO, focus the bulk of your time on creating great content. Because even if you have optimized SEO and you hire an outside vendor that helps you work on that, if you don't have great content, people are not going to link to it. And if they don't link to it, if they don't share it, if they don't read it, you're not going to move up in the rankings. I don't care how many keywords you have identified. So those are my thoughts on it. The next question comes from Chris. Hey, Michael, Chris Fontana here. I blog at chrisfontana.com. In your podcast a couple of months back, you talked about re-engineering your morning ritual. And specifically, you mentioned that you had some affirmations that you do. I'm a man of faith myself, and I have done affirmations in the past and continue to do some kind of inconsistently, and I'd really love to hear what type of affirmations you do personally. Thanks so much for the podcast, Michael. Looking forward to your answer. You know, I struggled with this for a while, Chris, when I was thinking through affirmations and I tried to craft some and all that, and then suddenly it dawned on me, duh, I've actually already got these in my life plan. Now, the way that I write my life plan, and I talk about this in my ebook, Creating Your Personal Life Plan, which you can download for free, by the way, at michaelhyatt.com slash life plan. More than 200,000 people have downloaded that little uh, ebook, and I'm working on a brand new book book on that topic with my good friend, Daniel Harkavy. That'll be out in 2014, we hope. But at any rate, in that book, I talk about creating a vision. And this is part of the action plan process, is to think about your life, each one of the categories in your life. And to think a, a, about a vision and then to state it in the present tense as though it's already happened. And I realized as I was working on affirmations that that's essentially what I've already done in my life plan. So let me give you an example. These are uh, the daily affirmations or the life plan account, what my vision is for my health account. And here's what I say. I'm lean and strong, possessing vibrant health and extraordinary fitness. My heart is strong and healthy. My arteries are supple and clear of obstructions. My autoimmune system is in excellent condition. I'm disease, infection, and allergy resistant. By the way, I'm just reading right out of my life plan. I have more than enough energy to accomplish the tasks I undertake. This is because I control my mental focus, work out six days a week, choose healthy foods, take supplements as needed, and get adequate rest. So those are, in essence, affirmations. They just happen to be my vision for the future as it relates to my health. Now, as I, when I teach on this, I often say, look, this is about a future state. You know, it's probably not reality now, and it's true for me. Uh, last week, I worked out three days uh, out of the week because I had the platform conference. So I don't always attain what my vision is for my health account or for my marriage account or my career account or any of the other accounts that I have in my life plan. But these make terrific affirmations. So I would say, rather than just struggling to get uh, a bunch of affirmations that are written separate and apart from everything else in your life, work through the life plan process 
and work through that vision statement for each category in your life so that you can repeat that on a regular basis and use those as affirmations to drive your thinking and drive the realities that you're trying to create as well. Terrific question, Chris. The next one comes from Christina. Hi, Michael. This is Christina Doring from Grand Island, New York. I blog at disciplineandgrace.com. I took your advice and I started a blog. In fact, I just opened it today. And I am wondering what your top advice is to bring new traffic to my site. Obviously, I don't have a lot of content yet, but as, I, as it grows, how do I take the site beyond family and friends? I would love to hear your ideas on this, and thank you so much for your website and everything that you do. Bye. Christina, this is probably the number one question that we get at Platform University. And I would encourage you, by the way, to check out Platform University because we talk a lot about traffic. It's only $30 a month. We have a tremendous number of resources, expert teachers, masterclass teachers, et cetera, to focus on this very thing. And of course, my platform book talks about this as well. But a couple of things is one, until you have about 10 or 12 posts, I wouldn't be too focused about generating traffic because you want to make sure that when you bring traffic, There's something for them to see, something for them to read, and you want that traffic to stick. Second thing is I would make sure that I have a method for them to subscribe to my blog post post once they visited that first time. And I recommend an email subscription form. You really want their email address. You probably want to create an incentive for them giving you their email address. It might be a resource list, a checklist, a template, even an ebook, but something that gives them an incentive to sign up for your email newsletter or your regular communication. And you can look at michaelhyatt.com and up the upper right-hand corner, I offer a free ebook in exchange for that. So once you've got all that sort of that basic architecture, that basic foundation laid, then you can try or, or start thinking about generating traffic. A couple of things. Use social media. Get out there in the social media spaces and tell people when you post something new. Now, don't become annoying. Don't do this so repetitively that you drive people crazy because it's really about adding value to the people that you hook up with in social media, not about pitching your own wares, although those can add value too, and I get that. But for me, that means about twice a day when I have a new blog post, I'm going to post on Twitter and on Facebook that I've got this new post and invite people to come uh, read it. Now, one of the things that Jeff Goins has done very successfully, in fact, he has a chapter in my book, The Platform Uh, book itself, on guest posting. In other words, if you don't have the audience you want yet, find those audiences that you would like to borrow if you could. Other uh, blogs, other websites that have the kind of traffic that you would like to get if you could and offer to create content for them in exchange for a link back to your blog. So that's another way to do it. Derek Halpern, who's one of the speakers at the Platform Conference, another method that he suggests, and I think this is terrific. I've seen a lot of people use that with great effectiveness is to create great blog posts and then specifically target bloggers that you think might be interested or people that have a large Twitter following or Facebook following. And you have to be careful about this. And he has a whole methodology which you can read about on his website at socialtriggers.com, but uh, where he targets the people that have the audiences and then he sends them basically an email message with a link to that blog post. Actually, he doesn't send that on the first round. He creates curiosity and invites them to ask for it. Again, it's a whole methodology. I don't have time to go into it here, but that's been effective as well. So it's a lot about outreach. It's a lot about marketing. One of the things that Derek told me privately at the conference that he recommends to people is you spend, if you've got, you know, if 100% of your time devoted to blogging, spend 20% of it creating new content and 80% of it marketing that content, which to be honest, I've never spent that much time marketing, but I think it's a terrific idea. Okay, the next question comes from Joy. Hi, Michael. My question is coming from England. My husband and I are missionaries here. We've been established in England for 12 years, and we have a small charity that we've been able to start with our team. And we have some tools, evangelism and youth ministry tools that we think um, would change the face of youth ministry in England. And I'm just my question is about the platform. We have a blog that is our organizational blog. Um, is it all right or is it advisable to build your platform under our small organization, which is an evangelism and discipleship organization? Or if we were going to 
um, publish our tools and resources, is it best to do that on a personal platform? And I'm thinking specifically blogging. Uh, we do blog through our our nonprofit's website. But I'm just trying to decide if we have to come out from under that and do separate blogging to set up a platform or if it's all right organizationally to do the blogging. Thank you. Joy, this is one of the top questions I get too when I speak on the topic of platform building. And that is whether you should blog under your own name or under the name of your organization. Let me just give you the positives and the negatives for this. First of all, anytime you can connect it to you personally, you're going to have much more loyalty, much more stickiness. Uh, you're going to get more engagement because people don't connect with institutions. I mean, think about it yourself. Uh, you know, we kind of have a distrust, almost a suspicion of institutions, but people will connect with you personally. So put a face, put a name on your institution. And even if you have a website that's related to your organization, which is fine, you've got to also have something uh, personally, I think. And I think that'll give you the optimal results. Having said that, you can be effective in blogging around an organization. And sometimes people do that with a group. Other people in the organization, you may want to do that. And I can think of, you know, lifehacker.com or the Huffington Post, you know, have been very successful at at doing that and to build enormous platforms sort of in a group uh, blog context when it's not related to the individual uh, blogger. So there are pluses and minuses, but if I were you, I would step out there individually and I would create a blog individually and probably have a blog or at least a website for your organization too. When I was the CEO at Thomas Nelson, we did both. You know, michaelhyatt.com probably had, I had 10 times the Twitter followers that Thomas Nelson uh, had as an organization but we still had to have that organizational side out there. That added credibility to me as an individual blogger. It gave me a place to point people to. And ultimately, I was after the success of my company. So uh, my success personally was related to that. So it doesn't have to be either or. But personally, I would lead with the personal brand and really invest some effort uh, and energy there. Our last question comes from Matthew. Hi, Michael. My name is Matthew Green, and I am from Sydney, Australia. I'm a huge fan of your website. It's a huge source of inspiration. I just wanted to congratulate you as well on the move to uh, more of a uh, discussion-based forum for your podcast. I think it's a wonderful incentive, and I really look forward to hearing uh, some of the responses uh, that you get uh, from other people and also some of the questions that you ask. Uh, my question today is, how do you know if it's time to leave your job? Um, I'm a passionate educator. I uh, run a website called I'm a New Teacher, which exists to help support new teaching graduates. But I, I'm just wondering, um, my, my goal has always been to work for myself and to help empower and equip teachers. Um, but I'm not sure uh, when the right time would be to leave my profession and to start chasing my dream, which is self-employment. I'm uh, looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Um, once again, I really value your feedback and I... I'm sure it is a great source of inspiration to so many people. Thanks so much for your time. Bye. Matt, thanks for your kind words. I'm not a career coach, and so I'm not sure that I can answer too much beyond my own experience, but let me refer you to my friend Dan Miller, his book, 48 Days to the Work You Love, Preparing for the New Normal, which is a terrific book. His website's great. His podcast is great, but he talks a lot about this. But let me just speak to you out of my experience. I try to be really alert, and it doesn't happen too often because frankly, I haven't changed jobs that often, but I try to be alert to this sense of discontent in my spirit. You know, maybe I'm just getting bored. Maybe I'm realizing that change is coming, but uh, I would say probably in the last 10, 15 years, I've been really trying to be aware of my own sense of the work and where it's going. And so that's where I developed this kind of restlessness when I was in my last job as the CEO of Thomas Nelson. And there was just something more. I felt like I'd I wasn't as connected to the work as I had been, and I was getting, getting frankly, just kind of bored with it. But I've, I've always kind of operated under the assumption that I never want to leave a situation that's bad. Uh, I really want to go to something or push towards something, not really be focused on leaving something. So is there something else that's really drawing your spirit or your heart? And for me, in this most recent transition, which happened now, it's hard to believe, two and a half years ago, but for me, it was this sense of really wanting to make more of an individual contribution, really wanting to write and create and speak. And I felt like I had all this content that was pent up inside of me that I had to get out. My job was no longer really in that, uh, even in the publishing world. I wasn't working with authors. I wasn't really helping them give birth to their ideas. 
I was really had become uh, a financial manager, somebody who was always relating to the board, somebody who was up to my eyeballs in administration. And for me, that just wasn't satisfying. So I would just say, pay attention to what you're feeling. You know, are you feeling restless? Is there something out there that you'd like to move toward? And then be smart about it. By the way, John Acuff has written a lot about this in his book, Quitter, and his book, Start. But um, I, I would be smart about this. You know, I just wouldn't leap out there with nothing. Uh, when I left Thomas Nelson, I had uh, a pretty significant platform already built so that I was able to make that transition, not risk-free, by the way, but I had at least reduced the risk so that I felt reasonably confident that I could step out without falling flat on my face. And, and sure enough, it was a uh, graceful transition. So I would be thoughtful and intentional about it, which is, of course, something I talk a lot about uh, in these podcasts. So terrific question. And if you've got a question, if you're listening to this podcast and you've got a question on any topic, I would invite you to ask it, leave a voicemail. Not only will I answer your question, um, but I will also give you a shout out on the air, or at least I'll let you have the opportunity to give a shout out for your blog or for your website. And you can leave a question at michaelhyatt.com slash podcast question. And I'll be back in a minute with some final announcements. All right, three quick announcements as we wrap up here. First of all, I've, I, I've announced here before that I've ratcheted down my spinking for 2014 because I just want more margin in my life. So I've gone from about 30 speaking engagements to a year to this next year I want to do 10. Right now, I've got eight of those slots filled. I've still got two available. If you're interested in booking me for your event or at least exploring that, go to michaelhyatt.com slash speaking. I'd like to get those nailed down here in the next six weeks or so. Secondly. WordPress setup. If you're thinking about launching a platform or you want to take your platform to the next level, let me encourage you to set up a self-hosted WordPress blog. In my opinion, there's no better blogging platform. This is what the pros use. This is what I use. It gives you the maximum ability to customize your blog and make it your own. While at the same time, it's simple to get started and it's easy to set up. I walk you through the whole thing in a screencast. And you can do it in 20 minutes or less. You can find that at michaelhyatt.com slash WordPress setup. All one word, WordPress setup. There's also in that post an affiliate link for Bluehost, and they'll offer you a special discount if you if you subscribe or if you get hosting through me at only $3.95 a month, which is a dollar off the regularly advertised price. Then the next podcast, which I'm really excited about, is my advice to new leaders. So if you're in a new leadership position, if you know somebody that's a new leadership position, you'll want to tune into that. And if you've got a question about that, again, you can go to michaelhyatt.com slash podcast question. Well, that's it for this episode of This Is Your Life. If, if you want to get to the show notes, you can do that at michaelhyatt.com slash 72 as in episode 72. I'd be so grateful if you'd show the love and share this podcast with others that you know and you think would benefit, you can do that at michaelhyatt.com slash love. That's a pre-populated Twitter post and you can just go to that, modify it, whatever you want, and then post it. That would help me. And also, if you would rate the podcast in iTunes, very simple to do, but it would be helpful to me uh, as well. So until next time, remember, your life is a gift. Now go make it count.